So some of you may know me, some of you may not. So my name is Justin Nell, as mentioned, and I'm originally from South Africa. And when I was a teenager, I moved to England, and three years ago, I moved here to Sweden. And today, I'm going to be talking to you about a journey that I have taken within the last two years being here, working at uh, my company, Tretman Tretihu, uh, or Tretman 37 for you English speakers. And <laughs> basically, if you've gone upstairs, uh, if, you know, if you haven't gone upstairs, I encourage you to do so after this talk, but we have got an event running called Kids Speak. And this is an event that I created, and my boss has allowed me to run, and it's just grown from there. And this is going to be this journey that actually brought this to being. So the talk I'm going to be giving is scaling the software industry by educating kids with open source hardware and software. And as I mentioned, this is for Kids Speak. Now, you might be wondering, some of you who haven't been upstairs yet, what is KidSpeak? KidSpeak is a custom-made bit of hardware and a custom-made bit of software that allows you to actually educate children in the ways of programming. And these are some pictures from last year when we were running it in Malmo. We were running at LeetSpeak Malmo, and we had a separate room, much like this, running a separate event. And it was more like a workshop. And as you can see, all the kids were busy. Some of them up there were just basically going, grabbing customized pieces, building the things themselves. Some of them were busy testing the code. Some of them were actually learning straight away. It, it gets a bit of chaos straight in the morning because people just want to jump right in and they start playing straight away. They don't want to wait for the lesson to start. They want to do it now. And that's great. We encourage it. But once the lesson starts, it becomes a lot more better. And people start to actually share with each other, especially kids, because I don't know about yourselves, but for me, when I'm with a group of adults I don't know, like at a, at a new client, and I'm kind of asked to kind of collaborate with people I don't know, I'm a little bit kind of shy and to myself, and I, I don't want to show off my things. Maybe it's total rubbish. But with kids, they, they don't have that nerve problem. They just kind of decide, yeah, have a look at this. I've made this. It's awesome. And it becomes something amazing. So I'm going to take you back a couple of years. At Threaton, I've been helping a lot with technical interviews. And with technical interviews, I mean, I'm not just also meeting the people. I'm setting up some questions for them. I'm going and re reviewing their applications a little bit when they're uh, sending in code. And the best part, I find, is actually when I meet the people. When I meet people, I get to ask them a whole bunch of questions. And the best part is, if you're applying to work at Threaton with me, Clearly, we have something in common. So we've got something to talk about. That's great. That's a basis. It's not like meeting a complete stranger and you don't know where to begin, like you've just met them at a bar or something like that. You've got a, a base grounding. You, you both like code. And maybe you both like the same company. So one of my favorite questions is, what got you interested in writing code in the first place? And you would be amazed at some of the answers you get on this. Some people go and say, like myself, oh, I started at an early age because my parents were into coding already, or they're engineers, or something like that. But there's actually extremely few people that have the same story as me. A majority of people actually don't even start learning code until they're adults, either in college, university, or maybe they decide to change jobs later on in life. And I ask them, well, why is that? Why do you not actually go and start learning earlier? Uh, is it due to financial uh, circumstances? And some of them, actually, the answer is yes. And that brings me to an example I'm going to go on to now. A friend of mine I met a little over 10 years ago lives in America. And he wanted to learn how to do software programming. And the problem over there is that the education system is extremely expensive when you want to go to university. So unless you want to take out these huge loans, quite often the option of kind of learning this way is not really an option. Or quite often the local universities for you don't offer a course you want to do, or they're kind of doing something that doesn't quite fit what you're after, or maybe you just don't fit it well in classes of people. So I decided to help him out, and we decided to collaborate on some code together. As you can see, it's a bit of PHP code back in 2006, but I can't really show the code because uh, it's an absolute mess. But um, <laughs> a 
like everything. Any code we write one year later, or even a couple of weeks later, oh, did I write that? <laughs> but yeah, we collaborate on a number of projects together. Initially, some basic things. And it built up, and it built up, and we started kind of making extensions to things like uh, Oscommerce, which is a um, uh, e-commerce platform, and a number of different things. And then once he was able to understand enough to help himself, we kind of lost contact. I ended up moving uh, to different cities and meeting different friends. And well, I have a bit of a problem that if I'm not talking to you on a regular basis, I kind of forget about you. So I don't actually talk to you. And I don't mean it in a mean way. It's just kind of, you, you're not in my active thoughts. So he kind of fell away, especially since he didn't live in the same country as me. So he disappeared. But I was cleaning out my old USB sticks, uploading them onto Dropbox, and sorting them by the years, all the sticks that, were, that I got the data, and I saw this one. And I thought, I wonder what my friend Chris is doing these days. I sent him a message, and I found out that now he's actually a site reliability engineer at LinkedIn, which is a company recently bought by Microsoft. And what his job entailed, from what he described to me, is he actually still writes code now for a living. But he writes code that tests everyone else's code. So unit tests and automation tests, or he actually debugs things when there's production problems and passes it on to the engineers. And it was absolutely amazing to actually speak to this guy again, because when I first met him, he didn't know how to write any code. He didn't fully understand how recursion worked, or pretty much most function calls. He didn't understand syntax of languages. He didn't know how to debug and work things out. So it was amazing to see that he'd actually over this course of time, made something to such a big company as LinkedIn. And I started to wonder, well, this is great. I'd love to do this. I love the feeling I get when I know I've helped someone so much. So how can I help more people to build these kind of success stories? And of course, I could pick a couple more friends that maybe want to get into this and help them one-on-one. -on -one. But that's not really scaling. It's I'm teaching one-on-one, -on -one. it takes a bit of time, and then it's a big time for the next one, then the next one, and the next one, and sure, I'm helping some people, but that's not gonna work in the long term unless I have a bigger group of people. I need to target, like, a classroom, almost. But the problem is, I'm not a teacher. I don't uh, still work at um, college or universities, and when I did, many years ago, the problem was that it was a set curriculum. I could kind of, customize uh, how I taught the kids, but not what I would be teaching them. That's set by the schools. And I wanted a bit more freedom. I wanted to kind of choose something that was a bit more fun and a different way to learn as well. I wanted to be in control of it all. And you kind of think, well, how do people learn to code as a group? Or how do people learn in general as a group? And I just started to think about it a lot. And I came to this realization after a while that, well, tech conferences, just like this. Not only by socializing with others, as I mentioned, the kids do automatically on their own, but at a lot of the conferences I go to, there's normally workshops. And you quite often can meet up with the, the actual speakers and you can do some things with them. They show you a whole bunch of things you didn't know and you can ask them questions rather than kind of going on and watching a video online or reading some books, you can actually do something interactive with other people and actually ask a, a very specific question of, I'm trying to do this, but why doesn't it work? And instead of shoving it on a question on Stack Overflow, you can actually ask a person who might know and you can work it out together or maybe someone else doing the course with you actually knows the answer. So to do this, I needed to create something that was a bit more engaging, more fun, and since we're dealing with kids here, it needs to be something that they want to do. The problem is children have a really short attention span. As we get older, we're a lot easier to kind of just sit and read a book or sit and watch a video or sit and watch me on stage. But if you have some kids on the stage there, they're, they're going to sit for a few minutes, they're going to have pants in their pants, as we would say, and they want to go do something else, because this isn't fun. I'm not a clown, I'm not a comedian, so how can we keep them entertained? It needs to be something fun and educational, and well, one of the things I did when I was helping some kids before, in a different field, 
of uh, work was I was helping a, a thing in England called Maker Fair. And Maker Fair, for some of you who haven't heard of it before, because I haven't actually seen it here in Sweden. So if I did, I'd probably be joining in it again. It's amazing fun. But basically, the concept with Maker Fair is a group of people who want to make things themselves or build things themselves. And it can be anything. It doesn't have to, it could be electronics, it could be uh, they're making things out of wool, they could be making things out of wood, painting, anything. They have a craft and they want to either teach people their craft or they want to sell and kind of promote their craft to other people. And that's the concept of Maker Fair. It's kind of sharing what you do. You're an indie person, but you want to share it with other people. And what I did there was I taught kids the basics of electronics. I taught them how to solder. And I taught them, rather than common cathode and common anode with LEDs, I'd be telling them the long leg is a positive, the short leg's the negative, and understanding why is this important with the battery, and allow them to solder the things together wrong so they understand this doesn't work. So we go and f uh, I go and fix it up, pull it off, and let them do it again, and they, they get amazed. They'd actually kind of see that learning to solder is fun. And on top of that, I remember the first time I learned to actually do some electronics. The first thing I did, and I think the first thing that most people do, is you, you solder together an LED and you make it blink. Well, you shove it in a breadboard, you hook it up to a computer, and you make it blink. And even though you might be writing some complex uh, distributed systems on web servers right now, but you're doing something on physical hardware. This is different. Suddenly, it's a, like a whole new world. And it's a completely different way that you actually write the code and different things you're doing, and you're holding this thing. It's not a full-on computer. It's not just lights on a screen. It's just this physical thing in your hand. And it's amazing. So these are the kind of things I was showing to kids to how to build. And initially, it was just two LEDs at the top there. And on the back of this, there was a battery clip. And that was it. And then for the older kids, we did something that was a little bit more advanced for around uh, Yule or Christmas, where we'd be connecting different boards together, forming a Christmas tree, sorting more LEDs, and it was a bit trickier to do. That was a, just a difficulty level. But at the end of the day, they're learning the same thing. And they loved it. For hours afterwards, they'd be going around showing to everyone, like, look what I made, look what I made. And it's a, a really basic skill, but they were really passionate about it. They loved that they'd made this themselves and put it together themselves and it was working. And especially the kids that broke it. When they broke it and then fixed it and it had it working, they had this even bigger passion about it. Because I think myself, when, when I'm trying to learn a new library or a new bit of code or a new language, if I follow every single step of the instructions and I get it working first time, ask me again next week to do it again. I won't remember a thing. I won't remember any of it because I just followed the instructions. It just kind of goes in one ear, out the other, and that's it. But if I break it, and it goes out, and then I have to fix it, I get into panic mode. And I'm kind of wondering, what's wrong, what's wrong? And I'm understanding deeply more of, why is this this way? Why is it that way? And then after a while, I just understand exactly everything. And you can ask me then two years, three years later, about this one specific thing. And I'll remember everything, because I screwed up on that. And it suddenly, it's, it glued onto me because I had a deeper understanding of it rather than just kind of following every single step of the instructions. It became something more interesting to me. But now moving on, th this was just assembling electronics. And this is not what I want to do now. I don't, I want to teach people to code. I'm passionate about electronics. It's what I do in my hobby. But I want to teach kids how, how to code. But I'd like to incorporate electronics to that because it's a physical thing you can hold. So the real question was, how do kids learn to code? What is the current method that they're doing it right now? How do people, I know people are teaching kids to code right now at a number of different workshops, but it's not standardized yet. It's just an ongoing thing because everything's changing constantly. We're getting new different types of technology coming out all the time, cheaper technology coming out at the time, and everyone's trying to lead their own kind of way. So right now, it's a free-for-all. Everyone's trying to kind of make their own solution, get to the goal, try and make the best solution. And maybe there is no best solution because it's very individual. Some people learn better one way and others another. But I looked into it anyway to see, in general, what is the most common way that people seem to teach kids how to code. And I came across this thing called Scratch. 
And I'd heard of Scratch multiple times in the past few years, but I never looked into it because it's just like Lego blocks, and I can do all that. It's going and making a few things on the computer screen, and yeah, sure, I can do that already, and, but I have more control. I can worry about like the garbage collection. I can make it faster loops if I'm doing it in a certain way, and I can handle things a lot better. So why would I want to do it this way? And it sounds convoluted and crazy. But then when I'm coming to think of it for kids, it's a different story. Suddenly, it's big, colorful blocks, and it's like Lego. You're sticking it together, then at the end of the, the line, you, you hit go, and something happens. And I thought, well, if I connect this to hardware, this would be amazing. If I can kind of get them doing these little blocks and blinking a few LEDs or doing something that they're in control of, rather than just they're putting it together and it works, they put it together and they're writing code for it, and it's actually still working or it's breaking, and they have more control to try again and do something different and change the patterns, change the, uh, the colors, change any aspect of it. And that sounds great. And since Scratch has been around for such a long time and it has an extensions uh, library, I thought, well, maybe I can just find an extension to speak to some hardware. And I thought, well, a lot of the time when I'm making hardware myself, when I'm kind of making things to sell or for friends, I normally go and find, okay, what's the cheapest microcontroller that I can actually do this on? Will it be a PIC? Will it be an AVR, an ARM? What's the cheapest possible way to get this solved? And I don't really consider anything beyond that because I'm going to read the data sheets, I'm going to work out what it has, and that's it. But when I'm coming to compatibility for other people, all of a sudden it's a different story. So I thought, well, what's very common these days? And I thought, well, Arduino. Everyone's using it these days. Everyone knows what it is. It's like a Raspberry Pi, but it was around longer. And it's very common, very stable, open source. It's free. They're cheap. And because it's, uh, the hardware and the software is open source, you don't even have to go and buy the official uh, hardware. You can go and buy cheap Chinese hardware of it. And it's still legal because it's just a copy of the open source designs. You can even make your own. And omit a few things if you want to kind of cut some costs a bit more or make it smaller or whatever you need to do, but it will just work. So all I need then is just an extension. And I found one extension out of the entirety of my searches online. I looked on Google for weeks, and then I looked on GitHub. I looked all over the place trying to find a collection of different things, and I found one. There was one single plugin or extension. And I thought, well, maybe I'm lucky. Maybe it just works. Maybe it's just so stable that you, there only needs to be one. So I download it. I installed it. Errors. <laughs> yep. And I've never used Scratch before. I've never developed extensions for it before. I have no idea how it works. And at this point, I've already gone and told Martin, my boss, that. I'm going to be running this event, and I've got a deadline coming up, and I'm kind of thinking, oh my, I really have to get this working, but I don't have the time to kind of work out how Scratch works. So I need to find another tool. There are other block programming things out. It was just Scratch was the most common one, but maybe there's another one out that does Arduino specifically. So I was looking online and looking online, and I spent, again, weeks and weeks and weeks trying to solve this, and I was almost pulling my hair out. I know I haven't got that much, but looking for ages to try and find a solution to this. And I came up empty-handed, and my heart's sinking, and I'm starting to think, I'm going to have to tell Martin that this is not going to happen. This event can't happen because I can get the hardware, sure. I know that stuff. I'm in control of that. I have all the pieces. But this part, the actual teaching kids how to use it, that's missing. So I thought, well, hold on. I don't want to give up just yet. I know I can do this. What if I made myself? And I'm thinking, but I can't make all this block stuff. I don't have the time to actually make everything. Maybe there's a library that can do some of it. Blockly. I came across this uh, open source library called Google Blockly. It's a JavaScript library. Some of you maybe heard of it. A lot of you probably have not. But it's extremely common, it turns out. A lot of these other block programming languages 
especially the games ones on uh, Android and uh, iOS, they're actually made with Google Blockly. And all Google Blockly is, it's a framework that allows you to design with interfaces what a block should look like, what it should accept as input, and you kind of set all these different parameters of how to kind of make the block in the first place. And the examples they give is how to generate JavaScript, Perl, and I think the third one was PHP. I can't remember. But regardless, it just gave you examples how to render code. So I thought, well, let's download this and let's give it a go. Maybe it's really complicated, but let's give it a go. I downloaded it, had to play around with it for maybe a few days. I got some blocks working, still just with standard JavaScript, but they were working. And suddenly I thought, this is going to work. No longer need to worry about this. I can just kind of go forward and worry about the hardware now. This part's pretty much done. I just have to go and make all the code for Arduino specific, because it's only handling JavaScript right now. But that's fine. I'll, I'm in control of that. And I want to abstract things anyway. I'm going to use a whole bunch of my own Arduino libraries to make it a bit simpler for kids. So that's fine. Let's put it on the backboard of that. But that's the solution. So time to design the electronics. And this part, I always find the fun part. I love building things. So I jumped to my desk, messy, I'm sorry. But uh, I jump to my desk, I grab all the different components I have, and I start playing around, seeing what can I do, what can be fun, what kind of works together. And also keeping in mind that on the Arduino, you've got a limited number of ports, so there's a limited number of things I can use. And also, I don't want to use expensive things. So I shoved on the breadboard, I shoved these little cheap speakers that I got from a Kickstarter I did a few years ago, and I thought, well, I've got a few thousand of these, I can use them, no problem, and kind of check, are they still good? I kind of do a few other things. I got these cheap little screens. I actually got them drawing a, a little logo. Originally, it was actually the Threaton logo, but I've lost that image, so this is a bit more recent. But moving on, I managed to get all these things working individually. And I design things a bit differently than most. I probably do it in a very amateur fashion, but somehow, to this day, I've managed to pull it off. I guess I'm just lucky, but when it comes to making things work. I don't go and check the full thing before I go and design my PCB. I check each individual piece works. And then I just think, yeah, well, that's it. It's done. It works. I just need to kind of make a PCB for it. And again, I lost the picture for when I actually designed the kid speaker ones, but from a previous design I did, I made these UFO-shaped uh, boards. And this is pretty much the design process I would have. I would basically list all the components I have, and I'd actually physically have them with me, and I'd just stick them on a bit of paper, and I'd be scribbling different shapes, kind of working out what looks good, what kind of spreads out nicely, and eventually I'd have something. And then after I'm happy with that, I go onto Eagle, which is the software I use to go and design the actual PCB, and I end up with something like this, which is the actual KidSpeak first iteration board. I send that off to China, and I have them manufacture it for me. And then I don't think about it, I just consider that's done. Unfortunately, this bites me a few times because, yeah, I make mistakes. Most common one is quite often to forget to actually drag something to a ground plane, so some LEDs don't work, and I have to manually fix things. But I've got that down to a fine art now, so people don't even notice my mistakes. But I need a case for this. For, before, with the badges, it was just hanging around rear neck, and the kids with the blinking LEDs, they were, they were happy with this. But now this is a bit more intelligent. It's going to hold an Arduino. It needs a case. And luckily, at Threaten uh, Who, we have a 3D printer. And I know how to use it, so why not use it? So I'm going to start making some prototypes. And this was the very first prototype I made. And it's a bit hard to see until you see some later images, but it was extremely rough. And it was huge and ugly, but it held everything for me. But another big problem I had with, with this was this first prototype, it took 26 hours to print just one. That was not going to work, because I had agreed with Martin that I was going to teach 20 kids. So I'd need to make 20 of these. And 26 hours for every one of those, that's not going to work. So. 
I was tweaking that a lot. I also had problems with the buttons. Again, I'm not sure if you can see, but it's a little bit warped and horrible. But when you're trying to print something really small to kind of, kind of connect onto something else that's even smaller, it's tricky, especially if you're trying to get it to print fast, because that's the key. I wanted it to print fast, but good enough to actually work. And I kept tweaking it and tweaking it until eventually I got something I was happy with. And this was the very first prototype that I was extremely happy with. Everything fit together. I hadn't put the buttons or the screen in yet, but it all clicked together, the Arduino fit in there, and it was a nice size in my hand, and it printed in a very quick speed, and I was extremely happy. I was like, this is, this is it. All I need now is lots of colors, because kids love colors, and so do I. And actually, part of the Kids Speak thing when we go up and start one of the sessions is the first thing is, go and pick all the colors you want. You need two of these, one of these, one of these, one of these, and you just kind of grab whatever you want. They're all the exact same uh, size, there's different colors, you kind of make it whatever you want it to be, and that's part of the fun. You're building it yourself. They're not going to solder, I'm pre-soldering all of this, but that's the part of the, I've put it together, because it's just all these plastic case. And that's amazing. So we went back to Blockly. And this was the old Blockly uh, UI. But I needed to, after adding my own custom code, I needed to make it look kid-friendly. So I spoke to a colleague, Threton, he's not here today, but uh, Magnus Firm, he gave me a little bit of help, kind of making things a little bit more kid-friendly in color. And then another one of my colleagues, uh, Nate, I don't know if he's here, but uh, he designed a logo for this. And we came up with this. And it's quite a bit of a change. But when you actually know that it's Blockly, you can actually see, well, here's the menu, and here's the blocks, and this part over here. Oops, wrong way. I'm going the wrong way. This part, I've moved into a separate tab here because the kids, they don't want to see the code. It's kids that are going to be learning this. They will want to see the code later. They can kind of click on there and it'll hide the blocks and show the code in here instead. But everything else, add color, change the font, maybe even Comic Sans, but something that's a bit more fun for the kids to actually look at. Because if, it's, if it looks boring, even if it's doing something fun, it is boring. They don't want to play with it. But I ran into a problem. Whilst developing this, I was making all of these blocks. The blocks didn't exist. I had to make everything for the Arduino. Now, of course, I was only limiting myself to what I thought was important, like setting variables, functions, loops, and uh, addressing the specific hardware that it was going to be on this kit. I didn't need to care about how to tell them to do everything. I was going to abstract a lot of it into my own libraries so the kids didn't have to think about what's an analog pin, what's a digital pin. I did a couple of those initially for myself, but then I made more that were abstracted for the kids. But the big problem was, every time I'm going and testing this, I'm having to go and click in that tab, copy the code, load up Arduino, paste, upload. And that doesn't sound that bad. But you try doing that a few hundred times in a day. I'm wasting so much time going and just copying and pasting, and it's slow. So this has to change. I needed to kind of automate this somehow, but I needed something open source and free, and I needed something that just kind of worked, that I knew how to work with. Well, a lot of the things I'm working with all the time, web servers. But something that's cheap and open source and doesn't need too much else with it. Well, for me, it was just Node.js. I know some JavaScript. I know I could have done it in C Sharp. I could have done a number of different things. But a couple of years ago, I switched over to using a Mac. And I sometimes jump onto Windows. But I want to use my Mac. And I don't want to have to install Mono and a whole bunch of other things. I want things just to work uniformly across all platforms. And this just made the most sense to me at the time. So I went with Node.js. And then I actually went ahead and made complex things to test the hardware itself. So this extremely complicated program here, I was dog fooding myself, a concept of where I was using my own product to test my own product. This I'm actually still using today, this specific program. Because when I actually, I'm physically soldering all these kits together, uh, but just soldering them together doesn't mean they work. Especially with the little speakers, they're extremely fragile. So if I've done something wrong and the speaker's broken, the kids are gonna be 
devastated. So what can I do? I have to go and test that every single thing works. I don't have a machine that can go and automate all this. So I thought, well, if I write a program that tests every single feature, then I know the hardware works. And if anything else after that, it's software problem. I made this crazy big program, and I use it, and it tests every single feature. But now, let's go back to last year. Last year, when we were going to do the LeetSpeak conference in Malmo, and we were doing KidSpeak. It's a bit of a crazy story. And Martin wasn't aware of this until actually at the end of the conference day. He wondered why I was so tired. He thought it was just, I was nerves. But I'd actually hadn't finished assembling and putting everything together until four hours before the conference. And I'm not cutting. I was cutting extremely fine. I'd even gone to the extent of actually regulating my sleep patterns and my uh, time at my clients so that I could start 3D prints and end them at times that I could make sure I'm at home to go and pull them off and load on the next load. It was insane, but I pulled it off. But the big issue was that at the end of the day, Oh, sorry, not at the end of the day. I, I got to the, the conference, and I had a little bit of sleep. I had two hours sleep. I had some coffee. I uh, had the shower, and I felt all fresh enough. But for a guy who's only had two hours sleep, not that great. But the big thing for me, as I'm kind of rolling this bag all the way over to the venue, I'm just thinking, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God. I haven't tested this. What if something breaks? What if something breaks? Because it worked individually for me but I'd only just finished a few hours before, and I really needed some sleep. I couldn't go the entire evening without sleep. So I just kind of hoped and prayed that this is gonna work, this is gonna work. And I got to the event, and as you can see, this picture of me over there at the event, every time a kid actually asked a question, I'm thinking, my heart's sinking, thinking, Oh God, my code's broken or my hardware's broken. What's going on? What's going on? Oh, I'm screwed. Martin's going to kill me. And yeah, no. Strange thing enough, there was not a single problem that was mine. We had <laughs> three laptops that were uh, giving us problems. One of them, the laptop, we borrowed a whole bunch of laptops that were loaned to us by a, um, a company called M Store at the, for the conference, and they sponsored it. Um, but they provided one of the laptops that was extremely old. You couldn't even install uh, Chrome onto it without it crashing. So that was a no-go. That was a failure from the start. So we borrowed another laptop from one of my colleagues, and we got going with that. The other two laptops, well, I don't know if people keep track of when uh, Mac uh, OS do their updates, but about a week or two weeks before the conference, they had updated their OS. And in doing this, they actually uh, caused it so that you, um, you get a kernel panic whenever you plug in a uh, serial device, such as an Arduino, which has uh, not got an authenticate uh, certificate. A little bit like Windows 10 now, where it actually it doesn't crash, but it just won't work. So that was a bit of an issue. So there was two laptops that had this new OS. And after lunchtime, we eventually fixed it. But to get past it, we just swapped those two laptops again. But otherwise, all the hardware worked. All the software worked. And the kids loved it. And I got to the end of the day, and I just thought, I survived. I love it when that happens. It's, I got out. I, I kind of fooled people, and it worked. It's amazing. But then I didn't really get away with it. I got this question. How can we use this at home? And that's, that, that was the question. I just kind of thought, OK, well, that's not a problem. You just need to install the Arduino IDE because you're using the hardware. And then you need to install Node.js version 6. And then, oh, this isn't really friendly for non-tech savvy people or anyone that's not a developer to use, really. I hadn't really even considered making it an easy to distribute program for other people. I'd shoved it up on GitHub so everyone can kind of pull it down and use it as they wanted, but I'd only kind of configured onto these pre-set up laptops and on the day, and it just worked for us. I didn't really consider people want to use this when they go home because, of course, they're going to want to use it when they get home. 
So to keep these people happy initially, I just took all their email addresses and then I sent them a detailed instruction list of how to get it working as is. And then I needed to kind of package it up into a way that anybody could use this. And that's when I discovered a thought, Electron. I never used Electron before. But it sounded pretty easy. You just kind of take something you've written in JavaScript with a bit of Node, and you compile it into a native application. And you can kind of bundle everything you need into it. And this sounded perfect. So I downloaded it, and sure enough, in half an hour, I actually had a native application of the entire KidSpeak app working. I thought, this is amazing. But of course, it wasn't completely seamless. There was a number of problems I was constantly fixing. Frantically as well, when people are going and asking for things and I'm publishing it, and oh, that breaks on that OS. Oh, and that breaks over there. So yeah, I also had these uh, scenarios as well. Fixing things, not a clue how they're working, but they're fixed, I'm gonna look into them afterwards. I'm sure we all do that. I do that even at my client quite often. If there's panic mode going on and there's something problem in production, you fix it first, you worry how you fixed it later. Then you do a retrospective and you do it better and kind of work it out so make sure it doesn't happen again. But I'm still doing releases. This is only seven days ago. Well, actually eight days today. I did this uh, last screenshot last night. But I'm still making updates because this product or project hasn't really died. It's still going on right now upstairs. And as kids are kind of making new ideas, I'm kind of making new blocks, or I'm adding new language uh, files, or I'm going and uh, adding a few little tweaks and perfections and fine tuning it, or I'm improving the UI and a few other bits. And it's constantly evolving. It never stops. And I think that's the kind of nature of open source, is that it never stops until someone stops working on it. But if it's open source, more people are going to play with it. Because it's not your project, it's everyone's project. You started it, but it doesn't mean that you're the last person to work on it. So what exactly have I done here? I've taken an Arduino, open source hardware and open source software. I've taken Node.js to kind of cause like a little bit of a server backend and actually speak to and find the Arduino hardware. I've taken Electron to bundle it so I can actually have a native application out of this. I glued it all together with some code that I just fumbled up together and polished over time. And I made this platform called KidSpeak. And I'm not that great with names. I knew I wanted a kid event. I wanted to at least speak, so I called it KidSpeak. We haven't even named the hardware devices, and I want to make a version two. And if I haven't named this one, what am I going to call the next one? Kids speak too? I don't know. That's a problem for later. But I got something working. And that really falls down into what I like to do. I like to make new things and use everything that's readily available to me for free, open source. And I love open source because without it, a lot of the things I want to do just wouldn't happen. I read books a lot. I find out how to do things a lot. But a lot of the time, I don't want to spend the effort of actually reinventing something that someone else has done. So I go and use something someone else has made before. And I actually go and make a lot of my own open source things. I'm one of those horrible people that makes a million NPM packages. So uh, whenever I'm making something useful, I shove it up on GitHub. I, I put it in a way that someone else can use it. Because maybe no one else will use it, but maybe they will. Maybe I'm going to save someone some time. I shove it up. And it's really the, the mindset I have that really attracted me to Threaton in the first place, the mission to create a value by sharing knowledge. And right now, I've been sharing knowledge this morning with uh, 27 kids, teaching them how to code. Some of them have done it before. Some of them haven't. But at the end of the day, they've learned how to make something amazing. And they're actually getting to take this home. A lot of them are probably tired now because, I mean, I'm tired myself. But <laughs> that's a different story. But they're taking this home, and they're going to play with it some more. And there's a 
packaged product that they can actually take home, put on their own, comp own computer. They can make some more code. They can make some more blocks. They can make some new kind of patterns and share with their friends. And as it goes by, maybe there's going to be other events. Maybe they'll come to it again. There's one kid up there who actually came to the Malmo one. And he's actually helping the others. But he's learning more stuff because along the way, we've polished and improved things. So it's constantly evolving, constantly sharing. And since he's come before, he's actually sharing himself. He's passing it forward. And that's the way it goes. You, you've got open source software. You've got open source hardware. There's nothing to prevent this happening for you to share knowledge with other people, train new people into new technologies. And I don't work at Silicon Valley. I don't work at Google or Microsoft or any big fancy company. I mean, I work at Threaton, an amazing company. But I'm no big name person. Most of you probably haven't heard of me before today. But I made something special. And that's the special thing here, that I made this. I made it in my own time. And now it's become something. And I'm helping developers of tomorrow by letting them have this opportunity to understand how to write code at an early age. Maybe some of them don't want to do anything with it. Maybe some of them actually think, yeah, this is fun. This is like Lego, but I don't want to become a builder or architect or anything. I, I want to be a cook. But that's fine. But you have the option now. You understand a little bit of the mindset. And if you want to learn a bit more, you move on to something else, a bit like Lego Mindstorms. You start with normal Lego, you go to Mindstorms, you go to the next thing, and next thing you know, you're actually sitting in front of a computer for 15, 20 hours a day just writing code. But that's the way it goes as a developer. But you have the option from an early age, and you don't have to learn it later. Because when you're an adult, it's a bit more difficult. But when you're a kid, learning languages, learning new things, it's easy. For when I, when I was a kid, uh, we had to speak three languages growing up in South Africa. And that's how I became a bit of a polyglot. But as I grew, I found learning other languages kind of easy. I never became fluent in other languages, but I picked up enough really quickly when I'm traveling. And it just kind of sticks to you. So if you learn these skills at an early age, that's what's important. You have it there in you already. And then you can just kind of use it later when you need it. And that's it. Thank you for listening. Slither. Uh, I've got a couple of minutes if anyone has any questions. Otherwise, I will be heading back upstairs to the kids. Yes? Uh, yeah, what's, the, what's the minimum age for, for the kids? So the, for the events that we've been holding, it's between 7 and 7. Uh, sorry. Do they, yeah, what's the age? Do they have to know how to read, or is it working yeah, so with the colors? Yeah, so we've been cho choosing for the ages between 7 and 17 simply for the ability to read. Nothing else beyond that. And also, kind of, uh, if you're younger, you're going to drag a few things around, but you actually have to think a little bit more. It's kind of like problem solving. So if you're like a four-year-old, five-year-old, maybe you don't actually have the um, inclination to concentrate on it too much. So we've been choosing seven, but it's not a, a strict thing. It's more of if you feel your kid's a bit younger and can do it, then that's fine. Not a problem at all. Anyone else? Hey. Yes. Uh, very cool. Thank you, Justin. Uh, it, it looks to me like you're at the beginning of something rather than the yes. end of it. <laughs> yeah, it's where do you the first see this, step. Where do you see this scaling? Like in in a few years, could it could it be an international thing or? Well, that that is the question because now that I've actually reached this point, and it's actually now at a stable platform, and I've now he held it three times. This is the third time I've run it. I've actually got my clients going and asking, can I actually run it actually for them privately, not as a, a kids speak event, but as just as an educational event for them to give to their staff on a weekend or like after work or just think different things like that. So it can actually expand a bit more like that. And since they're going to be paying for uh, the rooms, they're going to be paying for the uh, catering and everything like that, suddenly it's a bit more free income and it gets to share the knowledge and word of it a bit more so it can grow a bit more. And I think once we've established it well enough here in Sweden, I would love to have this a bit more international. I'd love to take it over to England. I'd love to take it over to Germany, the Netherlands, and then maybe even further. Because I've not actually seen anything else like this yet. I feel, to a large extent, when incorporating hardware at least, I think I'm the first, as far as I've seen. There might be others, but I've not seen them. So, yeah, I would love for it to go there. but. One step at a time. Conquer Sweden, move beyond. <laughs>
Anyone else? No? Nope. Got one down there. Yep. <laughs> How dependent is it on your hard work? And could you run it on an uh, ordinary Arduino? Sorry, could you speak that up? Yeah. How dependent is it on your hardware? Could you run it on an ordinary Arduino? So, I haven't got one with me, but if you come upstairs afterwards, you can actually see. It's actually an Arduino Nano that just plugs into it, onto the board. Maybe if I have a... Let's skip through a few. And... Okay. And... There. That's just an Arduino Nano. That's a regular Arduino. And that runs just the standard Arduino code. So it's a 80 mega 328p, which is the exact same uh, that the Arduino uh, Uno runs. So if you plug it into that, it will work. The only thing is, is that if you use the special blocks that I've designed specifically for the screen and for the buttons and for the LEDs and the light sensor, those are pre-configured to know exactly what pins they should be on. So the kids don't have to think about that. But I have other uh, digital write, digital write, read, and analog, and a number of other things on there as well. And I am actually looking at improving that further for different kits. But as for your question, you can plug it into any Arduino, only Arduinos right now, and it will work. The only issue is some blocks might not work if you haven't got things into the correct pins. And that's it. Any more? No? Thank you very much.